I am here today because somebody thought that I did something significant enough to be here to tell you some of my stories. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Um, at 27, I decided it was time for me to quit my corporate career and do something that I never thought I'd do in my life. I ended up launching my own company, launching a startup. So the career is something I actually went to school for. It's what I envisioned I was going to be doing. It's what I thought my path was going to be. I never took a single business class in my life. I never envisioned myself as an entrepreneur. But I have always envisioned myself as free and as happy and as just being able to make choices that really allowed me a certain lifestyle. So at 27, I was faced with this choice. I'm at this job that I don't like. What do I do next? And because I made that choice to take that leap of faith and completely jump into something unknown, I'm able to stand here today and tell you just a little bit about my company. It is an online platform for local professionals who are looking to connect with each other. So really does a lot for the community. And it's really just given me a platform. It's given me a platform to speak. It's given me a platform to share my ideas. It's given me a platform to live my life the way I'd envisioned it. So but the thing is, is the speed, I'm talking today about journey to freedom, and this is not really where my journey begins. I'm actually what you call a refusenik. So for those of you that are not familiar, this is a term that refers to Russian Jews that used to live in the former Soviet Union and were denied um, immigration from the former Soviet Union to wherever it is they wanted to go. Um, it comes from the Russian word atkaznik, which means refusal. So my family um, was living in the Soviet Union, and they tried to leave the, the, the country and weren't allowed to. But in 1989, when I was eight years old, we were finally given the green light. So the journey really begins there, at least, at least a lot of my journey. As you can see on this map, this was not a trip to Europe, mind you. This is us traveling through Europe to get to a better destination. And obviously, the reason that my family wanted to leave is because they wanted something better for themselves. They wanted something better for their children. So if you can en envision this as, you know, there were six of us. There was me, my mom, my dad, my maternal grandparents, and my uncle. So we're all different ages, and everybody at this point has had different life experiences. But at that moment in time, they decided that it was time to leave everything behind. I mean, I'm talking everything, right? All your possessions, you, can't, you don't immigrate with all your stuff. All your possessions, your friends, your family, your language, your culture, your citizenship, everything you've ever known, to get on a plane and go somewhere. We didn't even know where we were going. Now, me being eight, it wasn't as drastic, maybe, as it was for my family. But nonetheless, I was with them every day, and it's... Being eight, I most certainly understood a lot of what was happening. And it was really because my parents made that decision at that point to make this journey um, for something better, that at that very young age, I really learned that if there's something up here, if there's an opportunity, if there's an option, then really anything down here is not a choice, right? So it's, it's not even so much that I'm making a choice, it's more of the fact that I'm stepping into it and really trying to live and, and just keep, keep going on this journey. So looking at this map really quickly, just so you do kind of understand what the journey was, we went from Moldova to Moscow, from Moscow to Austria. We're there for 20 days. Um, then we ended up in Italy. And in Italy, um, we, we had to go to the U.S. Embassy, and they ask you many questions. Um, and one of them was, where would you like to go once you go to the United States? And... Being that we didn't have any friends or family here, we didn't really have a preference, but we heard that San Diego was nice. <laughs> so we asked for San Diego, and I'm pretty sure they laughed when they said, well, we'll just send them to Arizona instead. <laughs> so, um, so what happened was, is in Italy, the, after you go and meet with the U.S. Embassy, there's a gathering place, like a park. We all go to the park, and the, this... I don't know, a guy comes and yells your name. He literally pulls your name out of an envelope. And if he calls your name, it's literally like winning the lottery, and that means you get to go on to the next step. Not many people do. We've met people there that were stuck in Austria and Italy for years, living on streets just because they were stuck and they couldn't go further. He pulled out our names first, my entire family. And so we got fortunate, and we, got, and we knew we were, moving net. we were moving, and he said, and you're going to Arizona. 
nobody in Russia in 1989 has ever heard of Arizona, and we started asking around, and I am not kidding, they said, it's the desert, so expect camels and sand dunes. And that is what we all expected. I think my grandma almost had a heart attack over hearing, just hearing that. So we didn't have a choice. That's where they were sending us. So we get on a plane, and from Italy, we get to New York. We land in New York. It's a long trip. You know, we're walking off the plane. We're about to go through customs. This lady comes up to my mom and says, excuse me, do you know the Akinblit family? And my mom is looking at her and thinking, oh my God, like, are they sending us back? Did they make a mistake? Is this the KGB? What is going on? And she hesitantly says, we're the Akinblit family. And the lady says, oh, great. Well, I'm here from the Arizona Republic. And, uh, <laughs> oh, okay, we're not, they're not sending us back. I'm here from the Arizona Republic, and it turns out that at this point in time, the local Jewish federation here in Arizona had opened up a fund to bring over some of the Soviet Jews. And because we didn't have any family here, and because we didn't really have a preference, except maybe San Diego, they decided to send us here, and we happened to be the very first uh, people to arrive from this fund. And they, so it was a big deal to the local community here, right? Huge deal. I mean, to just, just to fathom the fact that the community got together, put together a fund, put together an entire infrastructure to help complete strangers come over from another country, and we happened to win this lottery yet again. So um, the media team, there was an entire media team, they greeted us, we get on a plane, and from New York, we go to, we land in Arizona. You know, and I remember it was nighttime, I'm looking, I, I'm looking out the plane, I'm looking for camels, I'm looking for sand dunes, I saw lights, but I was like, maybe I just can't see it yet. So we get there, we walk off the plane, and it was, it was unbelievable. We're walking off, you know, the plane on, in, in the tarmac, and it's lights, it's cameras, it's balloons, it's flowers, it's peoples, and it, they're, they're clapping, and it was just unimaginable, right? Because how many refugees get this kind of welcome to the United States? Not many, not many. And being as young as I was, I had no clue. Obviously, my par my, I'm sure my parents were like, what? what's going on? I'm not going to complain, but what's going on? And but I tell you, this is something that um, is a part of me, knowing that a community got together to do this for me. And I think that's also part of the reason why I personally have such a strong sense of community. And the company that I did create is very prominent in the community, and it's all about community. I mean, that may be a whole other TED Talk on that. But um, point being, we got here, and we were in Phoenix, Arizona. So what happens next? So I'm an eight-year-old girl. And, um, <laughs> and I go to school, and I'm just trying to fit in. I'm trying to fit in. I want to be like everybody else. And one time, the media came to school to document my journey, and they thought it'd be really fun to put me in front of the classroom to try and lead the Pledge of Allegiance. But I don't know if you can see, I'm clearly not holding the flag in the right hand. And I don't even think I knew where to put my other hand, but I was, I was mouthing something. So, you know, definitely, definitely trying to fit in, learning the language, learning the culture, um, you know, just trying to get along with the kids. And I've given, being that I'm in the media as often as I am, I've given many profound quotes. I, um, <laughs> I always try to say something very meaningful. But I tell you, nothing has been as amazing as the quote I gave them in third grade. You ready? Boys are stupid. <laughs> yes. I was fitting in. I was fitting in with the girls, and that's all that mattered. I mean, how lucky am I this was documented, right? <laughs> so, so, you know, but the journey went on, and, you know, it, it's cute and it's funny, but, it, but in reality, as you can imagine, any child of an immigrant will tell you that we are typically the first ones to learn the language, and because we are, we have to help our parents out with everything. So I was definitely placed in um, situations that probably many of my peers weren't, you know, which included translating anything and everything at the doctor's office, um, making phone calls, if something needed to be returned, rent, I mean, anything. You think it, I was involved in the process. And, you know, once again, as, as a young child, all I'm thinking is, I don't want to do this, but, but it really just, it does something to you, right? I mean, it does something to you psychologically when you're young and you're being put in situations that you're not comfortable with, but you get through them. 
and it propels you. And it just becomes a part of your journey. It becomes a part of who you are. Um, and me being, you know, in my adulthood, so many times people have come up to me and said, Gelly, how do you do the things that you do? Are you, are you fearless? I'm not fearless, but I've been very uncomfortable in many different points of my life, and I'm okay with that. I've just learned how to be okay with that. And I, and I prefer to be uncomfortable, right, because that's how I know I'm growing. So the story goes on. Our very first year here in the United States, um, surprise, my mom had a baby <laughs> seven months after, he, <laughs> after we got here. He wasn't planned, but he was our little miracle. Um, my brother, Paul, he's in the audience today. And um, it was so exciting for us because he was the first American born in our family. And so the, what everybody talked about, the entire community, the Russian community that was growing was that if he ever wanted to become president of the United States, he could. <laughs> Paul, I hope you don't <laughs> go down that road, but, <laughs> but, but um, it's an option for him, you know, and that was a big deal for us because that's not a choice that we have, um, but it's all about choices, right, and getting, just keep pushing yourself forward. So, Fast forward many years, um, I went to Arizona State University, and I uh, majored in communications. That was my degree, and like I said earlier, I thought this was going to be my career for the rest of my life. Um, and so my very first job out of college was in public relations. I got recruited to work for a company, and I lasted there for two years and three months. My second job was um, in corporate America. I lasted there two years and three months. There's some kind of a trend. And it was during the second job in corporate America that I decided um, I'm just not a good employee. I am a very, very hardworking person. I mean, I put myself through school on all scholarships. I did. You know, I want, there was no money. I wanted to go to school. I had to figure it out. Um, I've, been, I've been working since I was 14. But the idea of having to be constrained and doing one thing and one thing only and just being in a box, it just it didn't jive with me. But I'd never envisioned myself as an entrepreneur, as I'd mentioned before. So what, what do I do? I didn't know what to do. So I started networking to discover other opportunities. Not even so much other job options, but just really other opportunities. What else is out there for me? And I remember attending my very, very first networking event. Um, I don't even know how I stumbled upon it, but I walked into the room and I started talking to people and very quickly something started to happen to me. Like my heart was racing and in, um, adrenaline. I couldn't stop smiling. It, it really kind of felt like I was falling in love and I was. I honestly was. It was one of those moments that nothing could go wrong and it was like, it was, a, it was that high, like this natural high that you get from the dopamine pumping. And I walked out of that event and I said, how do I do this again? How, how do I replicate? I want, I want a high. <laughs> that was a great high. No, but it was, just made me so happy. And so I started attending networking events to keep meeting people and um, just, just to network, quite literally, right? Because when you typically go to a networking event, people are networking for something. I wasn't networking for anything. And they would say, what it is that you do? And I said, no, 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 let's talk about you. Tell me about you. Who are you? What do you do? And I discovered that people made a living doing the oddest things ever. Pet sitters. Just kidding. That's a huge industry, but I didn't know that at the time. I'm like, you're a pet sitter? Okay. And, and, I, and then, so I'm thinking to myself, well, if somebody can make money watching other people's pets, which, once again, is a huge industry, by the way. I just didn't realize it because I didn't realize it. I said to myself, I can figure this out. How do I network and make money? So without really knowing how to make money and networking, I just kept networking. And it got to the point where um, December 2007, my manager called me into the office. And she says to me, Gelly, we need you here for more hours, you know, whatever. There was just some, some project going on. And I looked at her, and I honestly don't even remember what I was going to say, but when I opened my mouth, I said, I quit. <laughs> and she's like, what? And I'm like, what? She's like, Gelly, we don't have to tell anyone no, no, I, I quit. I mean it. I, I'm going to put my three weeks in, and it was beginning of December, and I'm like, and I'm out. And she's like, are you sure? I, I think I am. I, yeah, no, it's, and it was literally like something out of a movie scene because I didn't expect this to come out of me, but clearly I was just so ready to break free. I just wanted to go and just live, make those choices. So I did. 
I did. And I remember I emailed one of my friends and I said, Karen, I quit my job and, you know, now it's just a sink or swim. And she replied back and she said, Gelly, you're going to fly. And I believe that. I believe that. I was like, you know, this is going to work. This is going to work because there's, that's the option right here. Anything else is just not a choice. And this was my, this was me breaking free. This was my continued journey to my own freedom. So I didn't know anything about business, remember, right? So uh, this is my very first business card. I like pink flowers, so I thought I'd put that on my business card, and I thought my name was kind of cool, Gelly, um, and that was that. And I just started with, I started with nothing. I started with a very simple idea, which, like I said today, has translated into um, a huge uh, network of people. We have over 32,000 local members here in Phoenix, in Phoenix, Arizona. We have a platform in um, Chicago as well that we launched last year, which makes me the CEO of a national company, and I kind of like that title, you know? And, um, but I didn't know where to start. I didn't know what I was doing. So people would ask me what was so difficult about it, and I can't explain it. I honestly think I blocked out a lot of the memories because to launch a company is detrimental to your soul, to your life, to everything. I'm not kidding. And so I was looking through my journal to see what I can share with you today, and there's just a little entry I'm going to read to you. It's a little dark. Bear with me. I got through it, but it was one of those knots, you know, and it starts, this is March 3rd, 2009, so this is about a year after we launched the company. Today, I feel like dying. Someone said, Gelly, you look like you can't take one more breath, and it's true. I think I will seriously just explode. Something is horribly wrong, and there's just so much noise. All I hear and feel is noise. You know, I don't know how to shut this out. I don't know how to get my body to just be quiet. I'm lost. I don't know what to do. It, you know, I feel like I'm not really moving forward. I'm moving in circles, and I don't know what's going on. I know what I want, but I don't know how to achieve it. And I feel like everyone is just grabbing at me, and everyone wants something. Leave Gelly alone. <laughs> I talk to myself. So... You know, just, just, it's just like a very tiny moment. There are many entries like that, but like I said, I could do a whole TED talk on that. But I wanted to share this because this is such a huge part of my journey and who I am. And I believe that because of what I experienced at a young age, I was able to deal with all those knots. And there are many, many, many knots and many circles and many more moments like this. So my, um, but is it worth it? Absolutely. And what I'm going to leave you with is, this is my daughter. Her name is Eris. A-R-I-S, but maybe, maybe also play on words. And I want to leave her with a legacy. You know, I want her to know who mommy is, what mommy did, and I want, you know, and I'm here for many reasons, right? I'm here because my parents took the journey. I'm here because I took the journey. And I know all of you are on your own journey. And if I was able to share something with you today that you could take with you, then I deserve to be up here. Thank you.